That's a mouthful, isn't it? Thank you, Chairman, for the introduction. Well, first, let's start with an hypothetical. You have this a large array of uh, wireless zero power sensors. These things can be in the field for years and years, don't have to worry about battery replacement or anything. Are you supposed to get information from them? And these sensors individually know that you're taking something or not, but how do you know? And how do you know without impacting your power budget? Currently, there's no commercially available, always on, and low power radio receiver. The addition of a uh, commercial radio receiver as is will pretty much negate all savings you've made on the setting side. Hey, this, uh, this is key here. We can sense things with near zero power, but how do we communicate with them on a similar scale? Hello. Well, what we did is that we include a you know, separate wake-up circuit to wake up a commercial radio. Uh, yes, commercial radios, lots of power and all that stuff, but it's only going to be turned on for a short amount of time. And, you know, and we're also using MEMS technology for this uh, wake-up circuit. So in standby, it's not going to use any power whatsoever. And maybe a little fender fire here and there, fender amp uh, here and there, but uh, very minimal uh, impact on your power budget. Over here is an, uh, <clears throat> a block a diagram of uh, our near zero power or of wake up. First, you get an, an uh, one gigahertz signal modulated at 100 kilohertz. Feed it through an antenna into a resonator, which has a resonance of about one gigahertz, and that provides a 30 dBm amplification. And then it goes into a passive resonant detector switch with a resonance of about 100 kilohertz. And from there, it turns on the, the commercial radio, and the radio does its own signal processing and communications and so on. But the key thing here is that at, uh, no energy is consumed until that radio is woken up. And on this slide, we have an assumed picture of uh, this block diagram and on the bottom here. Over here is a resonator. It's a uh, 4 micron of lube nitrite, uh, Professor Renati's cross lamai mode a resonator. And over here, we have a sensitive detector switch. And in between is good low parasitics routing into connected to. And, um, Oh, this animation isn't working. You know, but uh, the resonance mode of this switch is actually this middle beam uh, vibrating in and out of plane like a cantilever. Yeah. And moving on to the next point about how to get uh, highly sensitive switches so with like this very apparent issue of uh, the stress gradient for over about 200 microns, this thing is curling up for itself 10, 20 microns or so. Well, jump ahead a little bit. It's uh, how we're getting sensitive switches is by scaling gap and gap only. Let's say we scale it by a factor of beta, for example, keeping everything else constant, all the dimensions, materials, thicknesses, whatever. The polling voltage will go in by a beta to the 1.5 power, but the pull up force to separate the contacts it will be a scale by uh, the beta. Yes, that might be an issue where the contacts would get stuck and the device itself would not have enough force to pull itself apart. But if we were, if we were to keep the pull-off force and consequently the capacitance constant as we scale the gap by the same factor beta and keeping everything else constant, and the pulling voltage was scaled by the square root of beta. And Honestly, it's a worthwhile trade-off to sacrifice some polar force for in in a faster scaling of sensitivity. So I mentioned last slide about stress gradient. How do we get tiny gaps? Because uh, we're we're trying to design gap of 100 nanometers, and the thing uh, resonates at around 100 kilohertz. Well, our solution to stress gradient. Is by using a um, modified folded switch design over here where you, where you have the anchors on the sides and the contact in between the, the anchors. And what it is basically is that so the beam goes up and it comes back down with the same curvature and should be level. Easy. Not quite. 
This particular device is uh, 190 nanometers below the level of the anchors. And the reason for that is because of the curvature of this back portion over here along this blue line. This graph over here shows FEM uh, simulation of the back portion. You can see that uh, the sides are curved upwards uh, about 800 nanometers from the center where the middle beam and our contacts are located. So stress creating is not just a 1D problem, it's a 2D problem. And how do you solve it? Add a slot. Easy. You by adding a slot, so what happens to this back end along this orange line is that uh, the total curvature is much less. And more importantly, the center part is about level with the sides. This particular device, uh, the contacts are about level with the anchor level. Uh, so whatever design gap we impose on this, we will reasonably get. And there's more you can do, aside from adding a slot, you can also change the geometry of these side legs over here. You can uh, wind it them. You can also wind this back portion or thin it. You can also change the length of the slot as well. Um, worth noting that it turns out that this middle beam you know, it doesn't play too much of a role with uh, the final uh, vertical deviation of the contacts. And uh, this device over here is not level with the anchors. It's actually about 200, 300 nanometers above the level of the anchors. And that's because of process conditions, film stress profile and sidewall angle. So first with film stress profile, it turns out that uh, up to a certain thickness for thin films like aluminum nitride, silicon germanium, titanium nitride, and so on. And the stress uh, sort of, of uh, transitions from being extremely compressive to moderately tensile, or vice versa. And this uh, sort of plays into the sidewall angle where, you know, brought on by your edge, uh, for example, uh, for aluminum nitride, our sidewall angle from an uh, edge using a hard mass is about 70 degrees. And so you have the bottom, port, bottom layer, which is wider and stressier. And then the top layer, which is narrower, less stress here, and it will bend more. And that's uh, the main reason why this device in particular, it doesn't have its contacts level with the anchors. Moving on to process, it is a typical released yeast uh, structure on a uh, more of a silicon and uh, sacrificial. And the main difference is that we put metal rounding underneath our structural material, which is a lube nitride. Yes, this does introduce some bilayer stress, but we are able to compensate, if not negate it, with our current uh, geometry. Moving on to uh, the testing results for the switch by itself, it has a resonance of about 80.13 kilohertz, Q factor of about 8600, and we see amplitude saturation at minus 4 dBm where we detect about 1.5 picoamps of current. So that number is not that impressive because um, you know, mentioned uh, briefly that we are aiming for a design gap of 100 nanometers. Uh, this uh, switch in particular is uh, designed uh, with a gap of 600 nanometers, uh, mainly is to um, figure out this entire uh, the vertical deviation problem, you know, which is the main reason why our sensitivity isn't that all that impressive. Uh, moving on to our near zero receiver in itself. So the resonator we use is, uh, has a figure of merit of about 90, or a KD squared of 5.1% and a Q factor of 1770, with a resonance of 800 megahertz. Uh, so just as a reminder, switch only, minus 4 dBm, and wire bonded, it's, as you can see over here in the red and green squares. Uh, the sensitivity is minus 17.5 dBm. Earlier, I promised uh, 30 dBm of amplification. So, in addition to the larger gap, which causes sensitivity to go down by a factor of 15, in, uh, those wire bonds actually introduce about 200 femtofarads of parasitic capacitance. And that's an issue because, according to this simulation of a particular or a higher performance resonator. When you start from no or low parasitics, your uh, voltage amplification goes from 40 all the way down to 10 and with 400 femtofarads. Uh, 
25 to Farad says goes from 20 to 15. And uh, so this is why integration is uh, sort of, well, it is very important. So to uh, conclude, I've shown a photo, we've shown a photo switch design with a slot that allows uh, for a controllable gap. And a small gap is uh, essential for high sensitivity. Also demonstrate a low power RF receiver. And uh, more recently, we did test a switch uh, after the abstract was submitted which had a Q of factor of 9,000. We detected about uh, 100 picoamps at minus 8 dBm. Um, however, when we wire with a resonator, around the same number of 17.5 dBm. And when we wire bonded with an LC circuit, the sensitivity was minus 27 dBm. In order to get uh, minus 60 dBm or lower, we really do need integration. And um, and that's pretty much it. I'd like to thank uh, funding from DARPA and Zero and uh, Cossess Cleanroom Facility at Northeastern University.